This module will cover integrated pest management. Integrated pest management includes four basic methods of control. Those four methods are physical, cultural, biological, and chemical. An example of physical control would be hoeing a garden to remove weeds. Cultural control would include rotating crops and selecting pest resistant varieties. Biological control involves reducing pest populations by the use of natural enemies. This can involve the release of natural predators such as lacewings, the use of biological pesticides such as Bacillus thuringiensis, or the conservation of natural enemies such as avoiding the use of seven as they can kill mite predators resulting in a mite outbreak. Many people believe the use of pesticides is prohibited by integrated pest management, but such is not the case. Pesticides can be used, but only in conjunction with other methods. This is the last of the five sections for this module. The learning objectives for this module, including learning decision-making skills needed in pest management, understanding methods of controlling pests with the use of pesticides as a last resort, understanding resistance and how it is managed, learning the definition of common terms used in pest control, and understanding plant symptoms that may be confused with damage caused by pests. The first step in dealing with a plant problem is to diagnose the problem. Most plant problems in Kansas are due to our weather and environment rather than diseases and insects. Once the problem is understood, then the correct solution can be identified. This will lead to good stewardship and a better use of dollars. People often overestimate how many insects are actually serious pests. Only one-tenth of one percent are serious pests, and about one percent are occasional or sporadic pests. A number of insects are beneficial and in some cases vital. Honeybees come to mind, but there are many others. These images are both of ladybugs, with the one on the left being the larval form. They are beneficial in that they prey on insect pests, such as aphids. A very effective method of pest control is host resistance. Tomatoes are an excellent example. In this case, celebrity tomato is resistant to verticillium wilt, race to a fraserium wilt, nematodes, and tobacco mosaic virus. Resistance does not mean these plants are immune to these troubles, but rather that none of these problems will cause significant damage to tomatoes. Some of our older heirloom varieties of tomato may not have resistance to any of these pests and may be more challenging for us to grow. In some cases, I would never choose a variety of plant that did not have a specific type of resistance. For example, I would never purchase a crab apple that wasn't resistant to cedar apple rust since cedar apple rust is so common in Kansas. In other growing areas, other diseases may be more or equally important such as apple scab, powdery mildew, and fire blight. We have some crab apples and apple varieties that carry resistance to all four diseases. Biological control can also be an effective means of dealing with pest problems. Two of the most common biological controls used are both composed of bacteria. Bacillus thuringiensis, also called Bt, is sold as dipel and thuricide and is used to control caterpillars of moths and butterflies. It is very commonly used to control cabbage worms and cabbage looper on cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. The second bacterial pesticide contains the bacteria Saccopolyspora spinosa. Let's just call it spinosad. Spinosad is found in Natural Guard spinosad, Captain Jack's dead bug brew, and Monterey Garden insect spray. Spinosad is also very good on the caterpillars of moths and butterflies like Bacillus thuringiensis but is much better than Bt on certain other insects such as Colorado potato beetle. Cultural practices helps us avoid pest problems. Crop rotation means that closely related plants are not planted in the same spot year after year. For example, broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower are so closely related that the pests that attack one will likely attack the others. So planting cabbage where broccoli was grown the previous year will not help avoid certain pests. Crop rotation works well for soil-borne and mobile pests such as corn wireworm. Also, crop rotation can help prevent some diseases such as septoria leaf spot and early blight on tomato from becoming serious. Sanitation can also play an important role in preventing pest buildup. The lilac borer overwinters inside wilted lilac canes. 
Removing and destroying these canes before spring can help control the insect. Sanitation is also important with diseases. Removal of heavily diseased plants may help prevent the disease from spreading. Finally, squash bug population can be minimized by tilling squash plants under at the end of the season and by controlling weeds near the garden that allows the pest to overwinter. Mechanical control includes such things as hoeing, pulling weeds, or hand-picking insects such as tomato hornworms. Landscape fabrics have been recommended to be used under mulch to prevent weeds. However, over time, weed seeds will germinate under the mulch, but on top of the fabric. Roots from the weed penetrate the fabric so that when the weed is removed, the fabric is pulled up. We now recommend using the organic mulch without the fabric. Plastic mulch on vegetables is still recommended as it is in place for a few months instead of years. However, it must be disposed of at the end of the season. There have also been paper mulches developed that would degrade by tilling in at the end of the season, but often develop tears and allow weed invasion. Pests have the ability to adapt to environmental and human disturbance factors. Likely everyone has heard of antibiotic resistance for human diseases. Well, the same type of thing can happen with the use of pesticides. Using the same pesticide over and over will often cause resistance to build up in the pests so that control is diminished or ineffective. So what can we do? The first line of defense is for the judicious use of pesticides. In other words, identify the problem before you use a pesticide. Most plant problems in Kansas are caused by environmental stresses such as drought, heat, cold, etc., and not by pests. Applying pesticides when they are not needed will increase the chances for resistance. Accurate applications are also important. Using too much or using a pesticide where it should not be used can harm the environment. For example, spraying squash for squash bug when the flowers are open can kill bees. Always spray late in the day when the blossoms are closed. Integration with other pest management strategies can result in reduction or elimination of pesticide use. For example, choosing a crabapple variety that is resistant to cedar apple rust may eliminate the need for ever using a fungicide. Or growing a thick, healthy lawn may eliminate the need for herbicides. Rotating pesticides with different modes of action can also slow resistance buildup. For example, all synthetic pyrethroids have the same basic mode of action. They work on nerve synapses, which can result in the death of the insects. For example, bug blaster, spectricide triazicide, and bonide 8 are all synthetic pyrethroids, though each has a different active ingredient. The problem is they all work the same, so rotating among these products will not help. However, orthomax flower fruit and vegetable insect killer has a different mode of action and can be helpful if rotated with a synthetic pyrethroid. Your agent can provide assistance in determining the mode of action of various products. Most pesticide failures are due to applicator mistakes rather than the product being ineffective. There are three points to keep in mind to avoid mistakes. Those points are timing, coverage, and frequency. Timing is making sure that the pesticide is applied at the correct time. Coverage is making sure that all plant parts are coated with the pesticide and frequency relates to how often the pesticide can be used. Let's take a closer look at timing. Timing is especially critical for certain pests such as bagworms, peach leaf curl, squash bugs, and leaf spot on tomato. We will start with bagworm control. Bagworms are often not noticed until they cause extensive damage in August. Unfortunately, these insects often close their bags about mid-August and spraying will have no effect. The correct time to spray for bagworms is right around mid-June. They actually start to hatch during the latter half of May in the Manhattan area, but emergence from the bag is slow. Waiting until mid-June ensures that all bagworm larvae that have left the bag and are therefore susceptible to the insecticide spray. There are several insecticides listed here that will be effective on young larvae. The last one listed is Pinosid. It is an organic control and is very effective against bagworms. Bagworms are most often found on junipers but will feed on whatever they land on, including bald cypress and oaks. Therefore, the appearance of the bag varies as these insects use portions of the foliage to stick to the outside of their bags. 
peach leaf curl is a disease that can weaken peach trees due to leaf damage. This disease causes the leaves to pucker and swell. Unfortunately, by the time you see symptoms, fungicides do not work. Rather, fungicides must be applied much earlier in the spring. Application should occur before the buds swell. Usually this will be in March in Kansas, but maybe as early as February if we have an early spring. Effective fungicides include chlorothalonil, Bordeaux mixture, and liquid lime sulfur. However, liquid lime sulfur and Bordeaux may be difficult to find. In some cases, insecticides must be applied at certain life stages for the product to be effective. Squash bugs are almost impossible to control when they are mature, but easily controlled when they are young. However, eggs are laid on the underside of the leaves and therefore the spray or dust must coat that portion of the plant. Use 7, permethrin, malathion, rotenone, or methoxychlor for control soon after the eggs have hatched. The left-hand photo shows squash bugs hatching from the brick red eggs, and the right-hand photo is an image of the adult squash bug. Septoria leaf spot and early blight are common diseases on tomatoes that start at the bottom of the plant and work up. In severe cases, these diseases can defoliate the plants. The best control for these diseases is to rotate the tomato planting to different areas. However, in small gardens, this may not help. In such cases, a fungicide will be needed to be used. It is vital that sprays be started early, about the time the tomatoes are about the size of walnuts, as once the disease gets started, it is very difficult to stop. We normally recommend a product that contains chlorothalonil, such as daconil, orthogarden disease control, or fertilone broad spectrum fungicide, as there is a zero day waiting period between spraying and harvests. A zero day waiting period means that the fruit can be harvested the same day after the spray has dried. As we mentioned at the beginning of this module, most plant problems in Kansas are due to environmental stress rather than pests such as insects and disease. Environmental stresses would include but are not limited to heat, cold, drought, high wind, ice storms, and lightning strikes. These stresses can weaken a plant and make it more susceptible to insect and disease attack. One of the most important ways we can avoid plant problems is to choose plant species that are adapted to our tough Kansas conditions. Let's look at some examples of environmental stress. Leaf scorch is not caused by a disease, but rather is due to leaves losing moisture faster than the root system can supply it. Though this is most often caused by a lack of soil moisture, it can also be due to too much water. Saturated soils drive all the oxygen from the soil. Roots need oxygen just as much as they need water. This lack of oxygen in the soil can cause the roots to shut down, resulting in no water being passed to the top of the plant. The result is scorch, just like you see with too little water. A third cause of scorch is caused by high winds, resulting in the leaves losing water so quickly that the root system can't keep up, even in well-watered soil. This is most commonly seen with certain maple species. In leaf scorch, the margins of the leaves furthest away from the base of the leaf are often affected first. With evergreens such as pines, extended droughts can cause the tips of needles to brown or the tops of the trees to die. Iron chlorosis is a common condition in Kansas and is evidenced by light green leaves with dark green veins. It is caused by the leaves receiving insufficient iron. Though this can be due to a lack of iron in the soil, it is more commonly due to our high pH soils tying up iron so the roots can't grab it. The long-term solution to this condition is to lower the soil pH so that iron becomes more available. However, this takes time so a more immediate fix is often needed. There are a couple of methods used to provide iron more quickly. First, the tree can be injected with iron citrate or iron sulfate. This method produces very quick responses and will often last for several years. This is best done in the spring as the leaves reach full size. If the weather turns hot, this procedure can burn every leaf off the tree. Fortunately, the tree will throw out a new set of leaves that will be dark green. Another method is to use iron chelate applied as a drench. In other words, the iron chelate is mixed with water and then the water is poured under the drip line of the tree. However, most iron chelates do not work when the pH of the soil is above 7.2. A pH above 7.2 is very common in Kansas. 
in such cases, an iron chelate that contains EDDHA is recommended. This is most commonly found in the trained name as Sequestar 6%. The response to this method is also rapid, but will usually only last one year. Though galls may look like they are causing major damage to trees, they do not affect overall tree health. Galls are caused by insects or mites that inject a substance into the leaf that causes the abnormal growth. Eggs are laid so the gall forms around them and protects the young until it's old enough to bore its way out of the gall. It is tempting to try to prevent galls by spraying. However, sprays are usually ineffective as the insect does not cause damage by feeding on the leaves but rather stings it. Even if the insect was killed, the damage would already have been done. Also, pesticide sprays often kill natural controls, such as predators and parasites, that naturally control the galls over time. The lack of natural controls resulting in galls being present over a longer period of time than if the trees had never been sprayed. So let's review using pesticides safely. The first step is always to identify the problem. Is the problem due to a pest or environmental stress? If a pest, then identify the insect, weed, or disease so that proper control measures can be used. Second, it is best to only purchase enough pesticide for one season if possible. It helps if the pesticide chosen can be used on a wide variety of pests so that the number of pesticides purchased can be kept to a minimum. Third, read the pesticide label and follow directions. Do not assume that if a little is good, then a lot is better. Some pesticides would be less effective if over-applied. For example, some herbicides are carried from the top part of the weed to the roots, resulting in the weed being killed from the roots up. If the herbicide is mixed too strong, it will burn off the top, leaving the roots unharmed. The root then sends up new leaves and the weed recovers. Time pesticide applications when the pest is most vulnerable. For example, early insect instars, or life stages, are usually more easily controlled than later ones. Also, applying controls when populations are small is more effective than when populations are large. The National Pesticide Information Center provides science-based information on pesticides, including specific products, recognition and management of pesticide poisoning, toxicology, and environmental chemistry. The website is a wealth of information on specific active ingredients found in pesticides, including how they work and whether they cause cancer. The environmental portion of the website includes information on air, water, and soil quality, as well as pesticide effects on wildlife, if any. There is also information on pesticide poisonings and what to do in response, including a hotline number if medical attention is needed immediately. If a pesticide poisoning is suspected, we suggest that the person be taken to the hospital immediately. Take also the pesticide container with the label and the hotline number listed here. This ensures that the doctor will have everything needed for quick treatment. Well, this finishes the course of pesticide use and safety. If we had to reduce this course to two main points, those points would be identify the problem and read the label before using any pesticide. There are a number of sources of additional information on IPM, including those listed here.